Hello, everybody, and welcome to another installment of Club Muffet Talks. I am Chris. I'm Drew. And I'm Ryan. We're here today to talk to you about fun library things. We've, we've certainly never talked about this topic before. Um, in fact, we're going to bring you a short little feature about banned books. Uh, banned Book Week is one of the most... Uh, cherished events in the uh library uh programming series this is something that we have uh in just about every library in fact if if not every library uh there are quite a few books that we consider to be uh pieces of literary canon that um uh, for some reason or another, have been challenged or outright banned from being presented in school settings or or in uh, public libraries for for a multitude of reasons. Um, some of these are political reasons. Some of these are cultural reasons. Um, regardless of why they've been banned, though, uh, as librarians, our response has been: it doesn't matter. They're books. We are uh, we are tasked with being neutral parties who take any book, anything that is valuable, anything that is cultural, and we keep those for people to have access to in perpetuity. Yeah, it's 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 uh, in our job description, I think. Uh, What's interesting the, uh, is I remember uh, last year I, I was doing an, a regular instruction type session during band book weeks and i said does anyone have any questions at the end of it and so he goes yeah what the heck's a banned book and uh, i basically started talking about it because it's not something that's necessarily in the common vernacular to some extent yeah. real quick i'm going to go over this thing that's um this is actually a um a code of ethics that uh that librarians should abide by. This is by the American Library Association. Um, it, actually, one of these was just added, um, amended last year in June. Um, really quick, uh, it's nine, nine different principles that we have. It's a highest level service to all library users. Um, intellectual freedom and resist efforts of censorship, which is actually what Banned Book Week is all about. Um, library users' right to privacy, or we protect uh, library users' right to privacy. Uh, we respect intellectual property rights, uh, advocate balance between the, the interests of information users and rights holders. Uh, we treat coworkers and colleagues with respect. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to pretend like I follow that one. <laughs> um, we do not advance private interests at the expense of library users. Uh, we distinguish between our own personal convictions and professional duties, which is another major part of, uh, of Banned Books Week. In fact, um, uh, I was mentioning this to you two before, but um, in the middle school that I attended uh, when I was just a, a wee little Chris, uh, lowercase Chris, um, the either the current librarian at the time or a librarian before I had started attending would go through every single book in the library and strike through swearing or uh, words that were associated with mature or adult topics, um, which is uh, deplorable. Uh, it was deplorable for me to think about that as a like as an eleven year old, and now as a professional librarian, I. I can't even imagine that. Yeah. Um, we okay. The one of the other code of ethics we strive for excellence by maintaining and enhancing our own knowledge and skills. Uh, that's something that people like when they first start working at libraries. It kind of raises an eyebrow because it's like you mean I have to keep learning? You mean I have to keep doing like little uh, professional knowledge uh, things? And then, yeah, that's that's actually something that we do as a, as a matter of our profession. Uh, and then the last one, this one was from last year. We affirm the inherent dignity and rights of every person. We work to recognize and dismantle systemic and individual biases, to confront inequity and oppression, to enhance diversity and inclusion, and to advance racial and social justice in our libraries, communities, profession, and associations through awareness, advocacy, education, collaboration services, and allocation of resources and spaces. 
So that one's actually very, very recent. Yeah. Uh, and that's all to say that uh, our code of ethics actually opposes stuff like banning books or censorship or um, or anything that would call for us to remove items that we would otherwise have available for all of our patrons because we have to acknowledge that uh, professional and personal biases do exist, mm -hmm. but we have to leave them at the door. Right, right. Um, it's, it's funny, uh, before I worked at the library, like a million years ago, I worked for a, um, a Christian bookstore and we would have people come into the store to buy things that were of varying denominations and depending on what their background was the, they might be looking for books or materials that would be very against the philosophies that maybe the individual salesperson would have but you you were told in that scenario it's like you're not allowed to criticize their choice. Later, I worked for a non-Christian bookstore and we still had that same policy about you're not allowed to criticize what people buy. You know, it's like whatever they come in looking for, it's their right to buy that. So I had already had many years of that philosophy instilled in me before I ever came to the library. It's not our job to police what other people read. Exactly. Yeah. There's there's no judgment. There's no uh, there's no second guessing or or anything of that sort. If someone wants something, then we get it for them, and there's there's no question about it. Yeah. I'll throw something else in a little bit. As the old man of this group, as the guy who who um, who uh, started library my library work back in the nether nether times of olden days before there was printed text. Um, <laughs> It's interesting to see the evolution of this over time. I think nowadays we are helped so much by the fact that the internet exists. And for the most part, the internet is not censored, at least in this country. It is censored other places, but at least in the United States, there is this idea that the that the, the internet is free and available for anyone who wants to get their hands on it, which has really helped the librarians out a little bit. I know that when I first got into um, library school, one of the big problems was that the internet was this brand new thing that was going on. Uh, most people didn't have internet connections, so they went to the library to get internet connection. And as we all know, the internet was made for porn. So <laughs> there was this big struggle with the early libraries in that days. Do how, I mean, how much do we really want to abide by our, our principles that we will not censor anything? Um, and there was some real struggles in the, uh, in the, in the industry, in the in the librarian industry at the time, about do does a public library censor based on sexual explicity? Now, keep in mind also though that the screens are available for anyone who walks walks by to see exactly what's on the screen and stuff like that. And so it was a real struggle. But the fact that everyone now, well, not everyone now, but most people nowadays have access to this free and open internet, it's taken a lot of the burden off of us, our librarians, to kind of to have to enforce or struggle with these ideas of censorship. And that also uh, kind of broaches into the topic of is the internet a right or is it uh, is it a um, is it a luxury? Is it something that that is necessary for us as a a people and as a uh, as a structure of our society now? And uh, I I think the 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 general idea, especially in the last few years, has been that it is actually kind of a necessity uh, in terms of just speaking and and reaching out to people uh, or as something like a work or educational uh, service. Uh, but then we have also some uh, some uh, internet providers who, especially in the United States, and and I mean, in in a lot of places in the world, it is treated as as a uh, as something that's a necessity. But a lot of the internet speeds, especially, and prices for internet service are. 
uh, astronomical just in the United States because it's treated as a commodity. Yeah. I think that you can look at the internet and or internet access uh, in somewhat the same way that maybe you look at um, an automobile, uh, because I feel like they are both uh, tools that we use to, you know, make our lives easier. Uh, but they're not; n they don't have to be necessary to your life. Uh, and like with the car, you can walk to work if you live close enough, or even if you don't live close enough, you can still do it or you can use public transportation. And in a similar way, uh, you don't necessarily have to have internet at home if you can have access to it in other ways when you need it. Uh, that being said, that is a service, uh, a tool that libraries tend to provide. Libraries tend to be places where people can go to internet, to, to use the internet, to have that internet access. Uh, and it's particularly valuable for people who do not have that in their own homes. And it's it's weird to think that that is still a big issue, but it really is. I mean, my parents in uh, in East Texas are on satellite internet that caps at 250 megabytes every day. Um, that's like you can't watch, you cannot watch streaming uh, movies or TV shows. You can't. Uh, I mean, you can't use the internet really outside of like text-based websites. Uh, you can't, you really can't look at images at all. Uh, it's, it is strictly um, like communication. And even then, after you get that 250 megabyte cap, uh, even that can start to become very, very hard to maintain. Mm -hmm. Like so I we've uh, we've kind of got off the rails a little bit. We've we've talked about some uh, periphery sure. uh, involved with uh, with just open access and and our duties as librarians, and uh, that stuff all does fold back into what we're talking about. Um, but as far as the practice of banning books, uh, unfortunately, and if we're using a link from, or I'm using a link from ALA to show just some of the more popular classic books that have been banned, like in the last hundred years or so, or the most frequently banned books, and they can be banned for any number of reasons. Like I said earlier, it could be something like political, uh, like uh, I think, like Ryan said, it could be for sexual content. Uh, it could be something like the the uh, middle school library that I mentioned, where it's just just language. It could be for any reason. One of my favorite examples of this is recently uh, there was a someone took a picture of a 1984 in Band Books Week at at some library or some bookstore or something, and um, it was like it just had two examples of why it was banned, and there are a uh, probably a million reasons why that book in particular is banned. Uh, but for this this one example, the the two reasons they wrote was banned in the USSR for being anti-communist, banned in the United States for being pro-communist. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so a lot of the people banning books are not doing it with a critical eye towards the actual content of the book or what the book might be really saying. Uh, even though, as someone pointed out in this internet meme, that book is actually anti-fascist. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it has nothing to really do with pro or anti-communism or capitalism or anything. It's just a, a book that uh, that criticizes fascism. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go through and just talk about some of our favorite books that have been challenged or outright banned. Okay. I'll start. Okay. Um, two of the books that I absolutely love. Um, the first is Catch-22, and mm -hmm. the second is Cat's Cradle. Well, oh, I love okay. both of those. Yeah. And these are political satires. Uh, the first one is basically uh, making fun of the U.S. military. The second is making fun of 
things like academia and uh, the government and just general uh, American dream uh, life of styles and stuff, things of that nature. And I have a feeling that, and then we've talked about uh, talked about this sort of stuff before. A lot of times, the books are not necessarily banned because of the uh, the stuff in them. Um, if that was the case, uh, the Bible should be banned for excessive violence and sexual content to some extent. But well, a lot and of it has been challenged and banned in some places. It yeah. has. Um, okay, I'm actually uh, I'm gonna pull pull the curtain back a little bit and talk about a, a funny recent event. Uh, since Ryan did mention, in some cases, the Bible's been banned for just violent content. Um, I was playing a video game recently. I was playing Elden Ring. That's that's the new hot video game that everyone's talking about. And um, my character in that game has a very big sword that's that's as big as him. And in that game, you kill monsters and all sorts of other things. Uh, in particular, at this this moment of the story, I was fighting a 10-foot-tall giant man riding a uh, probably 50-pound malnourished horse that he rode using gravity magic. And okay. Because it's his favorite horse, and the horse loved him, so he had to learn gravity magic to ride the horse. Um, but... I was playing it, and uh, I have a little three-month-old daughter, and she just kind of, you know, she sees pretty colors on the screen, and it catches her attention. And my father-in-law was at my house, and he said, don't you think you have anything, uh, like, fun or maybe, like, uh, something that she can learn from instead of this blood and guts and carrying on? And uh, I said, well, I do, but she's three months old and she wouldn't really be able to differentiate since it's just colors on the screen. And um, just the last weekend, I think, she, she went to her first uh, Easter church service. And this church decided to show various clips from films such as uh, The Last Temptation of Christ and The Passion of the Christ. Uh, and a bunch of other movies that are um, pretty renowned for being um, extremely violent, but they're shown and embraced because it's a, a spiritual reason. It's a uh, it's a um, an example of uh, I think commonly it's said that this is this is what Christ went through to to um, to have mankind be forgiven. So that's that's blood and guts that's okay, but the video game about my big sword man in front of my daughter, that's that's where the line gets drawn. And it kind of reminds me of that a little bit, especially the way Ryan was describing that. I, I do think that the banning process or the logic or uh, expressed reasoning behind it uh, can certainly be uh oh gosh i i lost my word uh <laughs> <laughs> but uh uh very from a very personalized point of view i actually was watching a video uh, earlier about people talking about banned books and banned book week and they were talking about that uh, a lot of times the people who are challenging books are projecting their view into the book which is why you have this one book that was viewed as both pro and anti-communist, because the people that were criticizing it were coming at it from, you know, different viewpoints. And so it was like, oh, that's, you know, that's too much against what I believe. And that's a really big reason why we as a library keep these books and have a neutral position. We don't push people towards or against anything. We say this is this is a piece of culture and it's really up to our uh, our users to to read the book for themselves and to come away with it and to have their own personal interpretation of what the material actually stands for arbitrary was the word i was looking for arbitrary yeah that's definitely that definitely fits and uh one of the something that's that's kind of amusing about the books that ryan picked is that um for Catch-22, that was mostly based on Joseph Heller's own time in um, 
in World War II as a uh, as a bomber. He, he used his own experiences to create the story about this this uh, horribly inept bureaucracy surrounding uh, surrounding the military at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's not as if he were like he he wasn't really making stuff up. the The idea of the catch twenty two is is obviously a a ridiculous uh, satirical point. But the rest of the book is based on his direct experiences. And for Cat's Cradle, uh, Kurt Vonnegut was actually uh, I think he was in an anthropology course at his college. Uh, and he had a professor who said, there is no one I I will have ever taught in my life who I think is less deserving of, uh, of uh, anthropological accolades as much as you. Basically telling him, I don't think there's anyone who's, who's ever not gotten anthropology like you. That's the study of, of people and the study of, of humans. Uh, that that school then turned around and gave Vonnegut an honorary degree for anthropology because of that book. Yeah. Just, just funny things like that, where, um, the, the story around the, the writings of those books are almost directly in opposition to why they're banned in the first place. Yeah. Did you have some titles, Joe? Uh, yeah. Um, I, I mean, of course, I like all kinds of books, but uh, looking at books that I like that have been uh, challenged or, or or banned, I was looking at uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, which is was like actually burned because it was uh, satanic. Um, or uh, Alice in Wonderland because it promoted drug use uh, oh. because of the, you know, caterpillar smoking the hookah. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Funny thing to about Tolkien being stuff. banned is that he's one of the uh, the most renowned biblical scholars in the Western <laughs> world. Yeah, I was about to say the same thing. Um, he he was a well known Christian, um, well known Catholic, um, and uh, Lord of the Rings. There is a lot of Catholic imagery and Messiah figures and and morality throughout the book. So I, I find it hilarious that it was being burned for Satanism. Um, I, I always find it ironic to find Fahrenheit 451 be a challenged <laughs> or banned book. Uh, just kind of the height of irony to me. Yeah, that one, especially the 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 grand takeaway of that book is that it's not it's not the books that you need to worry about burning it's the words inside of the books that are really important yeah. where where you have the colony of people who have memorized books and and uh they actually are identified by the books that they've memorized because their whole purpose now in life is to continue the existence of those books of those yeah. words yeah uh, uh another another really ironic one that i saw was um uh, Brave New World being banned for making orgies and sexual content seem fun, <laughs> and I don't, I don't think that. Yeah, I mean, obviously, that's not a word I would use to describe any of the sexual content in Brave New World. In fact, I think I came away from that telling someone as I was reading it, this is one of the most horrifying things I've ever read in my life. Strictly because of that kind of content, and uh, it's it's just so weird that anyone could come away from that book, especially from what happens in the ending, and, and to ever say that it makes it seem literally quote unquote fun. Yeah. Uh, I'll throw in some history here, though, as well. Um, most of the younger people don't out there don't remember something called vice laws. Um, these were basically a series of laws that happened in the first half, first two thirds of the uh, 20th century here in America, where basically a lot of stuff nowadays is just viewed as fun or just normal everyday stuff. 
was highly illegal. We're talking, um, we're talking pornography. We're talking gambling. We're talking in in the case of uh, prohibition, alcohol. I mean, people forget that there were. Uh, if you had a a little card game at, at your house where where money was passed uh, hands, people were doing like little dollar bets and what stuff. You could end up in jail because of that. That was that was considered highly illegal at one point in this country. Um, uh, again, uh, just simple things like pornography, which is anyone with an internet connection knows it's all over the place now. Yeah. The, again, people went to prison at one time for for uh, for that sort of stuff. So it's 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 it's, it's People forget how serious uh, this sort of stuff was at one time. Um, if you went out and printed uh, uh, Lady Chatterley's Lover, you could end up in prison for the rest of your life. Um, and people send it, again, the people nowadays with the internet, with things being so open and so free, uh, forget how things used to be a uh, uh, hundred years ago. Yeah. Not even a hundred years ago, uh, I, I noticed that a lot of those uh, a lot of those bannings all took place in 1938, uh, and it's and they actually had a council, like a legal team, whose entire job was to crack down on on uh, what's the word you used on on vices. Oh, vice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which nowadays we think like that's that that's just such a such an appalling concept. But yeah, it's uh, this wasn't even a hundred years ago. Yeah, yeah what you're yeah. really talking about there is something called um, a lot of it is the uh, Smoot Harley tariff, which was uh, basically allowed people to ban books in this country for obscenity and other things. Uh, a lot of the ones that I was looking at about things being uh, challenged or banned, uh, almost all of them are at the very least, you know, within my lifetime. And most of them have been like since I graduated high school. So, you know, uh, you know, that's, I don't know, around the time you were born, Chris, or something. Um, <laughs> But uh, but yeah, I mean, not not a long time ago, not back in the you know covered wagon days, but you know recently, you know since the existence of MTV with or without music, uh, these uh, bannings and challenges have been taking place. And we don't really want to go into it too much in this in this podcast, but um, the banning of books is something that is increasing dramatically in the last decade um uh, mostly in school libraries nowadays and public libraries yeah yeah it's it's a real yeah we we don't want to talk too much about it because it's it's um it, it does really get into some some territory that as non-biased participants in, in this library system we really it would be very difficult to not state our um our opinions on it but um to reiterate the code of ethics that ala has set out we uh we resist all forms of censorship and we also embrace uh movements of social justice and and equity and equality and to to see that some of the books or a lot of the books have been banned for uh lgbtq plus uh content is something that we as librarians uh unanimously reject because yeah, that's that's very much part of our code of ethics is to always embrace uh anything that is well i mean it's to embrace anything that's that's in the written word really but to ban stuff that is for social justice and equality um we cannot as our profession stand by that right right um a thing that i was looking at about that uh reading different articles watching interviews and discussions about uh the whole practice of banning books one of the things that really struck me was people were talking about that because we live in a world where people are different 
um, you know, that in, 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 in so many different ways to ban books that express or show or talk about differences just alienates entire groups of people because it's like, okay, uh, we can't have a book in our library about a person like me. That means that I, as a person, am not welcome here. Uh, and to me, that's a horrifying concept. Uh, it's paradoxical. It, it, it's very real. Yeah, that's it's so it's bizarre. And that's yeah. one of the things that makes me angry about banned books. It's 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 literally to sum it up. It's saying, I don't like this, and I don't find value in this. Therefore, no one should like this or find value in this. Uh -huh. That's basically the sentiment behind banning of books is because I have a problem with this. Everyone should have a problem with this. It, it's 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 monoculture. It yeah. is the idea that there should only be one way or or one true idea or one specific way of looking at things. And that's that's anathema to knowledge. That's anathema to the idea of um, informed consent to some extent. You have to be able to accept all sorts of different views, different ways of liking, uh, 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 different ways of expressing expressionism. And then from that, you can make decisions about what you want. But to completely deny those is to, again, that's there's a reason why totalitarian governments ban books. Let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's, what's really uh, stark to me is not just the passive uh, possibility that nobody should find value in this type of uh, of literature or content it's that nobody will find value in this content oh, yeah. uh and and putting the idea of value as something that has to be um based in some viewpoint or moral rather than being you know like i said banning lgbtq plus books uh there's like you can't say nobody will find value in that because you could very much uh have like just to have somebody else who has any kind of thought that you might feel alienated for or that you might feel is uh is not represented in mainstream culture or even entertainment yeah. that is value on its own yeah um I have, um, well, I actually have a, a handful of books here, but there are a few that I want to talk about. Um, and the first is actually, it's not just because of the content that it was banned for, it was just because it, um, um, the context of this has a lot to do with, with the banning of books. And um, it's actually from a television program, which was heavily, heavily censored and, and um and challenged when it came out and that cartoon program is called south park um this show's been going on for like 30 years now so it's almost like it it almost feels like this is a uh a comment on itself but um there was an episode about uh the catcher in the rye it was specifically when the catcher in the rye was being taken off of like a national book banning or challenging list um, and the, the boys are, are asked to read it for a class and to examine and analyze it. And, um, at, at some point early in the episode, Stan tells Kyle, this is boring. This book is terrible. I hate this. And it's kind of in, in the same way that when it came out, South Park was this, this massively controversial thing. And now it's like. Yeah, adult animation like South Park and um, Family Guy and that kind of stuff. Uh, like they, it's it's its own genre now, and South Park is really not the most controversial thing that's out anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and they, it really does feel like that was a a statement on how it's grown alongside of like that type of animation, um, where 
The Catcher on the Right really is not that much of a a controversial book, in my opinion. Uh, It has a little bit of swearing. It has a little bit of mature content. But it's really a book about a snobby rich kid who loses his way. Mm -hmm. Um, that, That example will always be really entertaining, especially as a librarian. It's very entertaining to me to think of that book as boring when you look at the ALA website here and see all of the different examples of how it's been banned over time. The other book that I wanted to mention, one of my favorite books of all time, um, As I Lay Dying by uh, William Faulkner. Uh, in fact, right now we have a, we might not have it anymore, but uh, we had a uh, display of our favorite band books or our favorite challenge books, or just our favorite books, I think, in general. And I put As I Lay Dying up there as, as uh, my staff pick. And one of the reasons it was banned is because it challenged the existence of God. Now, As I Lay Dying is a book written in stream of consciousness. That means that it takes place strictly, all all of the chapters are are written in the perspective of a character. It's not in the perspective of the author or of an omniscient type of narrator. It is strictly the point of view of one character and and an analysis of how these characters interact. So to say that it's the book itself challenges the existence of God is to say that this book should be banned for a person, for a single individual also having that belief. The end. I'm done. <laughs> uh, well, you mentioned the fact that the display that went up, the display that went up was uh, basically a display of our favorite books. And uh, my favorite book was 100 Years of Solitude, which, uh, interesting enough, has also been banned. Uh, it's been banned for its offensive language, disrespect for religious or political authority, sexually explicit, emotionally disturbing scenes and themes, including war, death, incest, and the implications of the occult. Um, yeah, it was uh, purged from a California high school book list because the Nobel Prize winning author's book was seen as garbage, passed off as literature. And that is so. exactly what we talked about before, too, with with um, the uh, or actually this is before we actually even started talking. We were talking about the Canterbury Tales and that book is raunchy and nasty and and perverse. And it's one of the first works of English written literature that we still uh, hold dear to our culture today. Yeah. It's just, it just, that really just blows my mind because I have to wonder why can there not be value in something that is raunchy or, or, in the case of that book, um, touching on concepts of the occult. Mm-hmm. The, if if they're part of our culture, if, if they existed before, you know, if, if they, if there were things that put the ideas in the author's head to begin with, then clearly they had some value before the writing of this book. Mm-hmm. I think it comes back to the ideas. If you don't like this book, don't read it. Um, right. But don't deny that possibility for everyone else. I, uh, I have I have a thing to say that kind of goes with with that, uh, which is that um, in general, uh, because inevitably, uh, when when we're looking at challenged books or banned books. Uh, there, uh, a reason that gets put into it is because we're trying to uh, protect children from this material. Because a lot of times the the banning and challenging happens in uh, school libraries, and then sometimes in in public libraries as well. Uh, but my thing about that is 
if you're worried about what your kids are reading, read it yourself. Uh, possibly even read it with your child, or at least, you know, get your own copy and read it at the same time, because there'll be a couple of things that will happen with that. One is, is that you'll know what they read, and then you'll be able to have a real conversation with your child about the contents of the book. And so if you're worried that there's something that they're not going to understand, you can actually have a conversation about it. Or if there are viewpoints in the book that are differing from your viewpoints, you can talk about what the differences are and why you have the beliefs that you do. Um, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. And it's, a, it's the way that we should handle a lot of things in life is to actually learn about them and talk about them. And if you're worried that, you're, that your child is getting something different from that book that maybe you don't understand or you don't agree with, yeah, just sitting down and talking to them about why, like, why it is that they got something out of it, that can also broaden your perspective. Yeah. Because absolutely. you might be their parent, but you're still a human. Oh, yeah. And you're also someone else's kid. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like, there's there's never going to be a point where if you think that you have all of life figured out and you think that you have all the answers and that you're the end all be all for your kids morality and what they're going to know you're not and that's i mean it's it's a harsh thing to say but some people really need to hear it that you're not you're not done learning because they're not done learning yeah um, my my kids are older. My kids are adult. For 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 you're starting off off with your newbie child. My my kids are <laughs> adults. Uh, but I have learned so much from my children, and conversations with them have opened my eyes to things I hadn't thought about before. Changed my outlook on things because they weren't looking at it from the same viewpoint that I was. And I saw the value and the logic of what their attitude was and why they believed what they did. And I was like, wow, you're so right. And and have had complete shifts in uh, patterns of thought because of my kids. Uh, you know, so I, I have to offer that opportunity to the whole world. This is like, please have conversations with your children and listen to their point of view, even if, or maybe even especially if it's different from yours, you know? That's, yeah, that's the big part is especially if there's, if you just flat out don't understand it, that's when you need to challenge yourself. Don't challenge the book, challenge yourself. Yeah. Then the only other sidestep that I will say about the banned book thing is uh, I, I do understand a, a choice of simplifying language. I don't understand banning a topic, but I do understand saying this particular book about this specific topic shouldn't be read by very young children. And I do sure, understand yeah, that. I, I can kind of see that. You know, I do understand that. This is like, okay, because like, say your kid isn't ready for Hamlet, but they can probably watch Lion King, you know? Oh, sure. So, so you can have these things where you're dealing with a topic or a theme, but you're simplifying the language. And I get that. And I understand that. I understand the value of that. But I, I hate the idea or the concept that there can be topics that would be off limit. It's like you can have a conversation about where babies come from, and you can have that conversation with a three-year-old or a 13-year-old, and you can be as honest and open with both of those kids as possible. But the language you use and the way you talk about it should be different in those cases. But you can still talk about the topic. The topic shouldn't be banned. Yeah. I, I'm I'm in complete agreement with that, and and that's um, you know some of the things that are that are still that were banned a long time ago. Like I mentioned, uh, as I lay dying, one of the reasons it was banned was because it 
it heavily features a subplot that's not just about, but also considers uh, the topic of abortion. Mm -hmm. In fact, one character's entire subplot is about whether or not it's ethical or or um, right to even consider this. And this is the same book that that questioned the existence of God. And in the same way, it's entirely from one character's perspective. And that was that book is uh, like a century old now. And that's still one of our biggest cultural arguments. So for a book like that, that's about uh, a um, Southern family traveling in a, in a wagon uh, with their, um, with their dead mother in a casket um, to, to bury her um, for it to still have such a, a very clear and modern argument in it is is kind of stark. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, fellas, uh, we've been talking for a little bit. We talked about a couple of books that we like. We talked about the the act of banning books and why we as librarians cannot ever, ever, ever accept it. Yep. And there was something that I um that I really, really appreciated about um, one of these books that was challenged recently. Um, I had never heard of it. And and just to be fair, there are a lot of things I've never heard of. Um, we get like, we get dozens of books a day that are brand new that go on our shelves that I'm never going to read because there are too many of them. And, and this is one of many that's, um, that's a, um, as I mentioned before, it's LGBTQ+. It was recently challenged. I still can't remember the name of it because there were like 20 of them that were all challenged at once. Um, and just because it was challenged, it jumped up to like one of Amazon's top 10 books uh, or top 10 sellers of the month. Mm -hmm. And... For you know what, I'm gonna directly talk to policymakers and legislators. Unless you fully grasp the totalitarian, na totalitarian nature of of what banning books actually entails, you will never get that content out of people's hands. All you're doing is putting a spotlight on it. Yeah, and that's I, that's the most controversial thing I think I'm going to say. That's that's okay. the that's the kindest thing I'm going to say about it. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's all I'm going to say. That's, uh, let, let's draw the line there. Let's draw the line at you'll never you'll never get that information out of people's hands, especially in the age of the internet. Yeah. As Ryan said, it is um, it the internet has grown to such an extreme in just the last decade or so that um, the concept of something being gone forever no longer exists unless you're, unless you're in a totalitarian fascist state that can outright ban the existence of something, but it'll still exist somewhere. Sure. Right. And with that, I'm done. <laughs> Uh, I'm hungry, so I'm going to go get something to eat. Well, that makes sense. It's, it's, Joe, it's, 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 Ryan, it's that <laughs> anything else that you two would like to say before I uh, before I bid our listeners farewell? Those at your home, get something to eat, too. Eating is important. Yes. Self-care. Yeah, we cannot ban the eating <laughs> of food. Banned Foods Week. Let's start. Let's start doing that. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I, I, I will say, and this just goes with what, what, what you were saying, Chris, just, just now, is that I know for a fact that in the last couple of years, there have been an increase in book clubs that specialize in reading banned books. Yep. And that's, that's just going to continue because as part of human nature, we naturally want to rebel. Yeah, I think there's... And that'll fun. never stop. Never, ever. Yep. yep. So embrace it, especially now <laughs> when when that's kind of where the culture is heading for some reason. 
just embrace it. Just accept that uh, that there are things that people don't want you to read or see or even think. And question it for yourself. Yep. Pick up, come, come to our library and pick up one of these books because they're not going anywhere on our shelves. That's right. Well, except when they get checked out. Except when they're checked out and except when we look at them and say, this hasn't been checked out in 50 years and we need space. <laughs> yes, that too. That too. All right, fellas. It's been, it's been fun. And for our listeners, thank you for listening. Uh, we'll be back next time with, uh, with another topic that we'll have to delete the podcast for and come back in a week. <laughs> Not going to expand on that one. Uh, farewell, everyone. Have a nice day. And we will talk to you again next time. Yep. Be careful out there. <laughs>